My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Where we're going to talk about from R to Zap, kayfabers before the kayfabe effect goes crazy, man. Get this book, <laughs> pa ASAP. Pause this video now and go buy this book. <laughs> Trust us. Some business ahead of time. Octobriana, 1976. And by the way, note the size of From R to Zap. Uh, Octobriana 1976 is my new comic. It's a black light comic, which means it's printed with fluorescent ink. It glows under a black light. It does not look like any other comic. And uh, it's available wherever you buy comics. So pick it up at your local comic shop. Ask them to order you a copy if they don't have it on the shelf. And uh, pick it up soon, man, because it is selling better than expected. And we are running out of our print run as we record this. Jimmy, I think you should set, set higher expectations for yourself. You may be right. Uh, anybody that, that has this comic and loves it, thank you for picking it up. And if you want to see how it was made, I have a process zine available, 350 pages that features all the drafts, the original art, and much more at my website, jimrug.com. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor, serializing my Red Room comics up there right now. What you're looking at are bootlegs of uh, <laughs> the material that has been put up on the Patreon because I put it up there in a high enough resolution that you could enjoy the artwork close up from a microscopic level. Turns out that those files are high enough resolution. You can print up your own bootlegs. And, it was and a, send us copies when you do. <laughs> Absolutely. It was a four-page week at the studio this past week, Jimmy, man. And uh, the, this story turns into a, a, a woman in prison tale. Every issue completely uh, self-contained. But the task at hand today, man, from, from R to Zap, Harvey Kurtzman's visual history of the comics. This guy spans... Uh, Many, many decades. Uh, he wrote this thing in the early 90s, so it's fun to see how far along it goes. But it's essentially his oral history of comics, and he's highlighting the stuff that sort of moved the needle, but also the things that he liked specifically. It, it is great to see the range. I mean, even on display on this page where we see Mouse included with this stuff, uh, really interesting. And of course, if you're a Harvey Kurtzman fan, you think of all of the... Um, I guess parodies in Mad Magazine, like obviously a guy who loves comics, well aware of all these comics, and it's always great whenever somebody, a cartoonist, breaks this stuff down. Um, I guess in our own way, this is what we do on this channel, but there are several of these. Uh, yeah. Jules, Jules Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer, Jim Steranko has a history of comics, so you know there are several of these where cartoonists kind of weigh in on their history, and of course it's biased by the author, so Harvey Kurtzman, man, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. The introduction is pretty cool, and he posits that the first American uh, sort of generation gap piece of pop culture is the comic book. Uh, when those things came out, they were four kids, and you couldn't catch a, a, an adult dead reading one of these things. I think of that a lot whenever I think of where comics are, having YA and all ages stuff being published now, and then when I think of like the Japanese comics market, like there is this period where you have to sort of teach readers, you have to cultivate this this readers, and then they can grow up. So in this example, you get kids starting in in the, in the 30s when the comic books show up, but by the time you get to say the uh, 40s and, and into the 50s, suddenly you have soldiers and stuff, you know, and, and women reading romance comics, and you have these comics where it's like, oh yeah, that generation has grown up now. They can read, all, they get it, they understand comics. Starts off chapter one, Get you got to talk about the comic strip first. You know, first it was the comic strip, and it's all, you know, sort of usual suspects. You know, your Kniff, your Harriman, Seeger. Uh, one through line through this book is this fellow right here, Willis Renzi, also known as Will Eisner. I have this Hawks of the Sea reprint co containing like all of this. We'll look at this at some point. It's really cool to see, you know, uh, Will Eisner's first, you know, 100 pages of professional comics. Um, but, you know, this was a serialized comic strip and, and Eisner is a through line through this whole book. That makes total sense. That, that makes total sense because Kurtzman is such a formalist. And of course, Eisner, <laughs> you know, popularized a lot of those, those formal, uh, elements. Eisner touched, touched all, uh, all aspects. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's like a, like a Hitchcock. You take a look at Hitch Hitchcock's work and it goes from silent pictures to exploitation movies in the sixties. You kidding me? These are Eisner Iger books. The comic strips got ganged up and sold in pamphlets, you know, for 10 cents. But then there was enough demand where original material was, uh, was needed. 
Eisner Irish Shop comes comes into effect, and these are you know a sample of, of of those. And the the words from Harvey Kurtzman himself. You you want one of these books from every cartoonist you like. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, and and we've seen handfuls of this stuff and never enough, but they're almost these uh, creator commentary, director commentaries. It's so valuable to see like an actual cartoonist whose work you're familiar with and admire and to see their words. Like yeah. what are they looking, what do they see whenever they look at Will Eisner, you know? Harvey Kurtzman was a teacher at the School of Visual Arts right alongside Will Eisner. So definitely knew each other for a long time, worked in close proximity to one another in that, in that capacity. And, uh, you know, Eisner gets a big section in the book. And two voices in comics who are trying to make comics respectable as an art form, seen as an art form. So I'm sure lots of their conversations about that. And you see it in a lot of the work they're doing, you know, especially from this kind of 80s, 90s time period. This is the attempt to, I, I hate to say legitimize the art form, but it's practitioners who have always respected comics as being an art form, which means there aren't limitations. It doesn't have to be for kids only. And this is their chance to try to explain that to a wider audience. Now, we have to popularize the, 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 the comic book form. And what we're looking at here are sort of the three characters that, that made that possible and created the boom. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. All at uh, DC Comics. You know, uh, if you read about like the history of, of like Disney, it turns out that Snow White was such a massive hit that that company coasted on right. the success of that for a ve for decades for a long they lost money on almost everything after well, after us no wait for quite a long time that is the publishing model uh you know book publishers it's the same deal note on superman is uh max gaines being instrumental in superman's publication at dc comics max gaines eventually the founder of ec comics uh shortly after that that's that's a piece of trivia i recently discovered and yeah. uh I don't know, man. It blows my mind a little bit to think of like what gains two generations, the Gaines family, their impact on American comics history. Yes. One of the early comic book uh, superstars in terms of art before, before Jack Kirby really solidified. This is the work of Lou Fine. This is a guy I would always hear about, you know, interviews with old timers and stuff talking about how great he is. And I would get like reprints in terrible quality black and white reproduction and just be like, I don't get it. I don't see what it is. When you see the nice reproductions, it makes a lot more sense. And then we have like the the sort of immediate and like next generation of uh, superhero comics that that have humor components and are just these are like the more adored, you know, like that DC stuff, corporate stuff. This is the shit that like you know Spiegelman talks about. I think if you think of the the DC stuff that you named. It's not great cartoonists. No, yeah. Uh, it's it's concepts that had huge legs commercially, but the cartooning wasn't so much groundbreaking. This is that, uh, these are sort of the, the more, I don't know, better cartoonists. I don't know if it's right to say it that way, but certainly they had the idiosyncrasies of cartooning down, and so it is a pleasure to look at these. Cartoonists with more vision, perhaps. Uh-oh. You could bet that this guy's going to be a through line through a big part of the book as well, man. Jack the King. I got chills when I when I turned the page, Jimmy. Yeah, this is an exciting, just amazing era. You know, starting with Captain America, number one cover, not his start, but one of those iconic, you know, again, starting to look at comics history as I was getting into comics, about as iconic as you can get. Not only did he have a big hit with uh, Captain America, this Jack Kirby fellow, but Simon and Kirby created the romance comic. And this is the Lev Gleason stuff. Man, that is iconic as hell. We need to look at that too at some point because uh, both both of these genres, massive. You know, like it's hard to... Uh, we can't overstate how successful these things were. They sold in the millions, the single issues of these things. So many knockoffs. Comics are flourishing at this time. Comics for everyone, right? Maybe. <laughs> I love these uh, crime does not. I love this like Mr. Crime guy yeah. who's like the little devil on the shoulder kind of horror host dude that that just shows up like around people's backs when crimes are about to happen. All ghostly white. Um, I might have to steal that for, for my courage. <laughs> I might have to try one. Basil Wolverton. Yeah, man. Before before Basil shows up and 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 dude from Harvey Kurtzman's lips, we get to hear what he thinks about Basil Wolverton and and and. 
you know, during the timely comics where Powerhouse Pepper would have showed up, there were those Hey Look strips that were showing up as one-pagers in the same stuff. So they knew one another. Oh, man, it's really interesting to think of it in that in that time context where they are like uh, peers in a lot of ways. And, and, and it's like he knew Basil. Basil never had a hit. Basil participated in a in a contest you know like like any little kid could have won the Al Cap contest and Kurtzman was like where did they, hold up you're you're Basil from from Marty Goodman's office the powerhouse pepper guy give me some of that <laughs> yeah it's inconceivable when you think of him now Wolverton that that he wasn't successful for so long because he's so good. Like, you know, you look at the stuff that wasn't really successful, like a powerhouse pepper. Those are fun comics to read. We were looking at Jack Cole Plastic Man a couple pages ago and saying these are fun comics. This stuff is great. It still reads well. It's still entertaining and just somehow didn't find its audience. Can we talk about the adolescent Jaime uh, Gilbert Gilbert era comics, man? Though this ain't uh, this this is the original Bob Montana stuff. That's not your your Harry Lucy comics, man. But it's like you know the Archies. The John Stanley, uh, Little Lulu comics. It is Car great to the, see. The Carl Barks, the Walt Kellys. Amazing to see Kurtzman's assembly of this stuff, because you are right. There is a there is a lineage here that leads to the Hernandez brothers and to cartoonists of this sort. It's these comics that are just better quality than all the other comics that are coming out of all their peers. And they, st they stand out, you know? There's a reason that we know John Stanley and Carl Barks decades later yeah i mean they they helped inspire comics fandom they they helped keep the culture going and establish comic conventions another uh publishing house that that did the same thing ec comics of of which uh harvey kurtzman had a big contribution in uh in making that you know a standout publisher absolutely massive uh with his war comics and of course mad magazine weird that they uh don't go with the better reproductions of these you know yeah it's like scanned in from dude this might be from like his his like little it life. could be now this is a Bry byron price book and all Bi byron price books are like almost perfect you know like they like he fucks up somewhere in all of them well it's 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 mostly weird because of this yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's one that's like completely <laughs> restored and then five that aren't yeah I don't know. Strange, strange choices. And now, like, we're going to get to a section where he, he gives, you know, a couple pages of love to, like, his favorite guys from EC. So this is, like, the Wally Wood page, uh, John Severin, Jack Davis. You know, like, like they get good shine, as you would expect from a Harvey Kurtzman book. Al Williamson, Craig Steen gets, gets a section. Some of the master race shown off there. Man, that's Frazetta. Incredible. What a run. They look so good, too. Like, all the lettering. You know, you see the giant sound effects lettering, the title lettering. They were just really well-produced craft. I saw this at uh, at Frazetta's um, museum, the original. And it is an entire full sheet, probably bigger than the window of the camera, like, bigger than our little backdrop here, of just a single sheet of full of craft tint duo. I can't tone. imagine what the, how great that would look in person. Yeah. And these are his famous funnies uh, covers that he did, because that, because you know that was that was still going on. Man, Swamp Thing, right? You know, like Wrightson was such a huge fan. Like, like Wrightson, Wrightson has done this kind of like scarf, like that scarf. Everybody from the studio, Kaluta, Jones, they they took from that. Do you think uh, th this is Frazetta referencing Wally Wood, right? The sci-fi stuff. It, this could have come before, wow. and and what Wally Wood used was ju it's a submarine, you know, a submarine when you draw some other doodads and stuff. I just think of that so much as being like owned by Wood. Totally. When you draw something like that, people say, "Yeah, that's a cool Wood homage." Kurtzman work itself, and he's talking about his thoughts going into the war comics you know there was all this like rah rah gi joe shit happening and like i he wanted to do the opposite this is a precursor like he's inspiring this is in the 50s he's putting thoughts in the mind of those kids who are going to become 18 years old around the vietnam era boy and 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 start having their own thoughts about getting sent off to a brainless war 
This is amazing um, because he's known, I, you know, I would say he's best known for his, of course, Mad and yeah. War comics. And it's very interesting, the contrast between the subject matter and the tone of those two two types of comics. But they make sense. It's almost gallows humor or something. And the artists, you know, uh, the Wally Woods and the Jack Davises, it's the same deal where it's like they go from this these two sides of the coin and they're great at both of them. Right. And they fit perfectly with him. But it feels like psychologically there's something there. This is more of his, the, the mad work. Right. And in his words, describing, you know, the thoughts going into... And look, look at the choices, man. Flesh Garden, Batman, Terry and the Pirates. It's, it's, it's like he was preparing for this book when he was working on Mad. This is that director commentary stuff, too. The stuff that's so valuable to see a creator like Kurtzman speaking about these details. Yeah, and of course we get a really good sample of all of that. He uh, participated in a few issues of the magazine. Um, at War with Gaines, he won a 50% uh, rights, uh, you know, 50% stake. Gaines is like, get the fuck out of here, and he did just that. And then, uh, just like the DC stuff, Batman, Superman, like... The strong start of Mad carried it until last year. I do think the Mad post Kurtzman, there are highlights in there. Yeah, there's a good run for a long time. It's from specific creator, like when Sergio pops up, when Don Martin hits his stride, Spy versus Spy. Like there's there's absolutely great stuff built on his ideology. The the uh, the almost savage attack on things like advertising. <laughs> you know, that momentum stayed for a long time in Mad after Kurtzman left, and it does inform a lot of the choices, I, I think. Hugh Hefner hits Kurtzman up. Hugh Hefner, uh, a lover of comics, yeah. you know, a, a failed cartoonist. There's a big documentary. I think it's uh, you can stream it on Amazon Prime right now, and it's like Playboy cartoons. You know, it's kind of a history of that stuff and gets into his love of it, and then a lot of the cartoonists that worked and came through the pages of Playboy. Two issues, two issues of Trump come out. Uh, Slick Magazine, expensive magazine to produce, did not get uh, the reward, did not have the sales that were needed to uh, sustain it. Sub sublime work, man. Incredible production. Self-published, Humbug. Yeah, self-published with the help of the artists that were you know, part of it. It was kind of a group, almost like a co-op put together. Fanographics has put out a very nice reissue of this high quality uh, you know, reproduction of it. This is a weird, you know, like I have that humbug reproduction and you read them and it is very much of the time. Yeah. It's incredible. That it's a who's who. The guys that are that are making this are incredible cartoonists, but it's so specific. Like it feels like such of a time period. Very interesting comics. And, and you can see they're going for an adult audience, you know, like just visually you can see this. These are not targeted at children. Yeah. Um, suffered from distribution issues, as you could probably imagine with these like venture publications, uh, a lot of gatekeepers at that time, help magazine, which bridges the gap. And we're going to look at, I have the Goodman Beaver collection yeah, from, from, uh, from kitchen sink. And we're going to have to go through this, yes. uh, and just look at the art in one of our, you will not twist my arm to do that. <laughs> But help uh, helps it brings in uh, young Robert Crumb, Gilbert Shelton, uh, Jay Lynch. Kurtzman keeps his uh, his you know if it, if if this was not a Kurtzman book, it it wouldn't be in there <laughs> because you know this did not move the the culture of comics forward in any real way. But it, it kept not. Up, it kept up the association with Hefner for a long time. And and you know Harvey Kurtzman, you're gonna study his life right you're going to study his body of work did little orphan Fan annie did little annie fanny for a long time you yeah know, it, this is kind of what comes out of the hefner collaboration because of the the longevity of, of how long the strip ran and you know there are collections of it you can see the production stuff again on display and you can find things like in the you know you can find examples of his process for making this and talk about detailed like robust work man yeah. layer after layer of building that stuff up from rough layouts to this this level of polish and, and finish gilding the lilies as we speak man launches into the underground era super cool let's breeze through for the rest man because we got the underground era having some movement in uh comics outside of the mainstream also very influenced by kurtzman a lot totally. of this underground which artists. is why it's, it's packed here um because obviously 1961 you know, the Marvel era comes before 
the undergrounds and stuff but the, you know so that makes sense in terms of curation this comes out you know this comes out this comes out this like all like are you kidding me it's powerful to see that spread are i mean you that kidding is a me? murderer's row you know that's the like the 30s yankees or something <laughs> the marvel era more kirby once again keeping that curation sound and in, in a sp specific order steranko like the people influenced by uh kirby and this is a byron price book so we got a pimp byron price uh stuff here more modern era this is where we start getting into you know barry windsor smith howard chaikin yeah direct mark what would be the direct market and allowing some of these guys to sinkevich pop up frank miller of course has to get in and with Kurtzman's thoughts from a guy who was there at the inception of the comic book and what he thinks about Dark Knight Returns. Interesting to think of Kurtzman doing like Super Duper Man. You know, we're clearly a fan of superheroes and then like look at Watchmen and look at Dark Knight Returns because in a way they're both pulling from the same source material. How about this spread, Jimmy? Wow. It is, this is a really nice overview of, com of comics history. Influence of European comics, Metal Arlant. Some of these things have been sent to us in uh, recent times, man. Shouts to Darren M for that. Fun to see a guy like Kurtzman becoming aware of this, you know, international comics. And, and, you know, I think a lot of us follow this path. You start to find these things and just be blown away by what are they doing in Europe? Turtles. <laughs> Boom. End it with the, the raw era. And dude, his students from School of Visual Arts, you know, Charles Burns didn't, wasn't a part of that. But the raw, the yeah. raw crew. And the promise of like that young Art Spiegelman who worked at Tops, like you know, taught at SVA too. Exactly, you know, he would have been involved in some of these uh, probably heady conversations with Will Eisner and, and Kurtzman. And why not the guy who's doing raw? But he has some ideas on the subject. Los Bros, uh, Pete Bag, <laughs> Give Me Liberty, D Dave Give It to Frank Miller, <laughs> The Dreamer. We might have to do The Dreamer on the on the channel, dude. Anyhow, man, from R to Zap, uh, it's a book. It's sort of a little known book. It's a book I discovered only a couple of years ago. had no idea it existed, and I'm so happy to have my hands on a copy. It's a great book. The production value is top notch, which is really nice and kind of a change of pace for, for this time period. So very nice history book. Okay, favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Octobriana is in shops right now. Limited basis, man. Those things are going quick, so get your hands on it fast. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor for Red Room Comics. Three bucks get you the archive. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we're doing. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video, so you look your best. <laughs> Jimmy, going through this, man, tell me you ain't jazzed up to get back to drawing comics. Indeed I am, Ed. Let's, let's get the heck out of here. Give them the marching orders, dude. Read more comics.